All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Deverna. I'm a PhD student here at uh, Indiana University. We work with the Observatory in Social Media. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, welcome you all to the awesome speakers event today. Um, and as we usually do, uh, I'm going to give sort of a quick overview of the observatory, the uh, awesome speakers event, and then I'll introduce our, our awesome speaker for the day and we'll get into the, the good stuff. All right, so uh, the observatory on social media, for those of you who haven't been sort of, you know, cross paths with us before, uh, which we refer to as awesome, is a joint project of the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, and the Media School at Indiana University. Um, so awesome is uh, an interdisciplinary research group that is interested in all things at the intersection of media and technology. And as the name suggests, we have a particular focus on social media. Uh, we conduct rigorous academic research, build analytical tools and software for both scientists and journalists, and work to educate the next generation of computationally skilled media professionals. Uh, so uh, we encourage you to visit our website to learn more about you know, some of our latest research papers or tools or really anything else going on with the observatory. Uh, you can see the link there at the, the bottom of the slide. Uh, as part of the observatory's interdisciplinary mission, we've organized the Awesome Speakers virtual event. Uh, the event consists of a series of talks from some of the brightest researchers and scholars who are working to rigorously understand how social media, the internet, and technology impact the world. Uh, so please make sure that you check out the event page on our website, which is at the bottom of the slide, uh, and you'll see more information on our future talks. We have uh, one more talk next week for this semester, and then we have a, a bunch more next semester as well. Uh, if you find the topic of today's talk interesting, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll be interested in the others we have lined up for you. And with that, uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jaram Burdock. Dr. Burdock is an associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. And I think uh, we're particularly lucky to have her speaking with us today. She's currently enjoying California on sabbatical as a, a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Uh, before that, she was a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research in New York. Uh, and before that, she received her PhD from the Computer Science Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She utilizes network science, machine learning, and crowdsourcing methods, and draws from scientific knowledge across multiple science, uh, social science communities to contribute computational methods to the field of political communication. Her recent uh, scholarship is focused on topics related to news production and consumption, election campaigns, and online social movements. Um, and now we'll just get started in just a second, but uh, I wanted to go over the structure that we typically use. Um, Jaren's potentially going to be giving us kind of a bonus uh, study as well. So we wanna give her the full 40, 45 minutes that we typically have to discuss, uh, discuss her work. And then we'll save the questions at the end. If you have any sort of really quick clarifying questions, you can feel free to, to sort of chime in. Uh, if not, you can leave questions in the chat or save them uh, for later and you can ask them yourself. Uh, and now I'm going to stop sharing and let Jaren please uh, share your screen and take over. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for this great introduction for inviting me. I'm really excited to share some of our uh, work with you. Um, so is the um, screen, is, is the, are the slides working? Excellent. Yes, you're okay. looking good. Oh, okay. So uh, yes, as Matt said, I got greedy and I added a second study if we have the time to discuss it. So, um, uh, but um, um, again, happy, happy to be here. So um, as Many of you, I am interested in uh, improving our information and, and political uh, environments. And um, uh, some of my work is related to problems around misinformation exposure. And some of that is related to um, um, odd party uh, um, hostility uh, types of questions. And I wanted to hit both of these things uh, in this, uh, in this uh, today's talk. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, there is fantastic work related to both of these uh, problem areas uh, in, in past research. And a lot of them are related to the behaviors themselves. Um, this talk is going to be about the, oops, um, the environments and uh, how changes in the environments can uh, be um, sort of related to changes in, in these behaviors that we're interested in. So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to be focused on social environments that people are embedded in and how changing those can uh, limit uh, um, misinformation exposure. And here, uh, my lab and uh, collaborators at SI, uh, we are interested in network altering interventions to change people's social media repertoires. Uh, and um, our interest is in an in experimental work, but today I will share with you an observational study 
on how these environments change organically so we can learn from them to inform our, um, our experiments. The, in the second part, um, uh, I, I'm going to be uh, talking about how we can build fun and engaging environments to deliver uh, polarization reducing uh, interventions and tell you a little bit about our game guessing uh, that corrects political misperceptions in a um, sort of party game environment. So we'll start with the first one, uh, which is uh, on um, misinformation exposure. And just, okay. Um, and um, let, let's get started with that. So um, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, there is uh, a really uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, work in this area already, uh, especially in, in the past decade. But I, I know that a lot of folks at Awesome would know, uh, you know, working on misinformation and ru rumors before it was cool. So uh, obviously more work in the past as well. And, and a lot of this work is uh, focused on uh, individual factors. So here, for instance, um, things like selective exposure, cognitive reflection, um, inattention uh, are commonly uh, studied in, in past work and their relationship to, um, to um, um, misinformation exposure. There's some work on the environmental factors and um, um, or you can also refer to the sort of the architecture of the world that we are embedded in. And the most commonly studied one is the algorithm, right? So even before there was um, uh, empirical evidence for it, scholars, you know, uh, include perhaps uh, uh, myself as well, would gesture towards the algorithm playing an important uh, role in um, problematic uh, things that we see online and offline. And there are indeed some audit studies that suggest that they can uh, lead to uh, misinformation exposure. But uh, I think that we are seeing uh, more and more in the recent past that um, um, that uh, um, the uh, causal evidence for this is is um, at best um, mixed. So an example here is the largest field experiment to date uh, done on, uh, for instance, uh, Facebook and, and Instagram recently that suggests that uh, uh, algorithmic recommendations do not promote misinformation. So uh, this is, uh, the algorithm itself is an important, uh, you know, point of investigation, sorry, cats. They have to be in videos, uh, and um, but here in this talk, I'm interested in a in the environment that people build for themselves, uh, and uh, we're basically um, going to be inspired by some of some scholarship from media studies, um, um, the uh, social uh, the media repertoires. Uh, uh, coined by uh, Kim in 2016 that suggests that users curate a set of uh, sources that they regularly sort of visit and that makes up their media repertoires. Um, and we're interested here in the networked version of this, which is uh, the environment that people build uh, by themselves or themselves by deciding who to follow. And um, so that's the that's the goal here. And the way that you build your environment in this case is two ways. One of them is who you choose to uh, friend. Uh, and the second part of it is who you choose to uh, unfriend or, or unfollow. So we're going to be focused on the second part of, of how this unfollowing happens. Um, the research questions uh, are, uh, the first set are uh, related to prevalence. So the question here is how often are misinformation spreaders unfollowed? Um, for this, we track how often spreaders are unfollowed from the first point to second point. So we had two snapshots of, of the network that we were looking at. Um, and um, the second question, because we wanted to contextualize this, we want to understand if the number that we see is you know, low or high, um, we, we want to ask if misinformation spreaders are unfollowed at a different rate than non-misinformation spreaders. And for that, we compared how often a subset of followers in our sample unfollows spreaders versus non-spreaders. Um, beyond just understanding how often things happen, uh, as I said, we are hoping to have interventions out there. So we really wanted to understand why uh, people uh, unfollow or under what circumstances uh, they unfollow to inform these studies. So we also have questions around the predictors of unfollowing. 
uh, uh, what predicts unfollowing a misinformation spreader. Uh, so we here model unfollowing as a function of initial exposure, ideology, age characteristics, and, and platform activity. Um, and uh, I think the prevalence questions are pretty straightforward, right? And we're just looking at how often things happen. Uh, but um, for, re uh, for the predictor side, we had a set of uh, specific um, hypotheses. Um, so the first set of these hypotheses are related to the amount of initial exposure at time T1 and how that's related to the degree to which uh, people unfollow at time T2. So this could go uh, in, uh, in two ways. One, uh, uh, one way could be what we uh, sort of uh, refer to as reversion hypothesis uh, um, or maybe um, uh, misinformation exposure being self-correcting. Self is that um, higher exposure at time T1 being associated with a higher unfollowing at uh, time T2. And this can happen uh, through various reasons. One of them could be, for instance, redundancy. If you're following a large number of misinformation uh, uh, spreaders, uh, maybe they're sharing similar things. So each one of them is um, less valuable to you and maybe uh, sort of creates information overload uh, and uh, might lead to uh, unfriending um, uh, in, in time at T2. Uh, or it could be that maybe you are not um, intentionally following misinformation spreaders, but incidentally, um, so um, with each one, you kind of have a chance to uh, identify that they're misinformation uh, spreaders and having this regression to the mean of, of, of uh, unfriending some. Um, the other way this could go is what we say is the inertia hypothesis. So this is where higher exposure at time T1 is associated with lower unfollowing at time T2. And this could happen because maybe high exposure at T1 is indicative of selective exposure, like you're seeking out what we as scholars name as misinformation or fact checkers in this case. Uh, or it could be um, the cause of believing misinformation. So there's some evidence that repeated uh, exposure will make you uh, believe in, in misinformation. So once you believe it, you might again be uh, less likely to pursue it as misinformation and therefore not wanting to un un unfollow or unfriend. Um, so this is the one set of uh, questions. We didn't really know coming into this, which one, which way this would go. I'm curious what your uh, predictions are in this case. So I don't know if both can use chat. Uh, uh, maybe you can pre-register your, your predictions before uh, before we uh, see the results and, and we can see uh, what comes out at, at the end. But for now, I'll, I'll just uh, move on as folks are thinking about this question. Uh, and uh, the second set of uh, hypotheses that we had were related to ideology, which is another important factor in past work on misinformation. So here we hypothesize that one, liberals would be more likely to unfollow misinformation spreaders. Uh, some of this is coming from uh, evidence on um, liberals just generally being more likely to unfriend people on social media, irrespective of uh, misinformation. But some of it is also coming from the fact that uh, a lot of the misinformation out there has a conservative uh, sort of uh, leaning and, and therefore uh, liberals might be less happy with that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, and, um, and this uh, second uh, hypothesis related to ideology is that we have some evidence from past work that misinformation exposure is uh, higher for ideologically extreme people. Uh, so we expected uh, politically extreme users to be less likely to unfollow at time T2. And uh, finally, we were expecting a negative interaction between uh, conservatism and ideological strength because again, past work suggests that extreme conservatives have higher misinfo exposure, um, which maybe suggests uh, their, their demand for it uh, compared to uh, extreme, uh, extreme liberals. So these are uh, the specific hypotheses we are, we are testing in addition to uh, looking at the prevalence question. I'll just get into our data pretty uh, quickly. Um, and try to demonstrate this on this very simple toy example network that we have. 
Um, so imagine we have uh, this particular uh, network. Uh, we start first with identifying health misinformation rumors from Poltafact in March 2023. Um, health misinformation, this was partly um, due to uh, the funding um, uh, uh, agency that, uh, uh, or funding uh, reasons for this project, but also because we uh, again, are hoping to run experiments and we think that we might be more uh, likely to convince people to unfollow health misinformation spreaders as opposed to, to political ones. Uh, so we identify those, um, uh, basically URLs and, and tweets uh, that are uh, labeled as, um, as um, uh, um, uh, misinformation by Pultifact. Then we found users who shared those URLs um, uh, or, or tweets correspond to these uh, rumors on Twitter. We did uh, some work to filter out uh, debunking uh, uh, tweets, and we also limited our investigation to spreaders that had less than 20,000 followers to study regular users. So this had, again, a theoretical reason. We wanted to understand regular users, um, and uh, but, but the second thing is again API limits uh, would make it really hard for uh, to hard to ident uh, hard to um, do this for really uh, extremely popular uh, um, um, accounts. So let's say that these two S are are spreaders that we have identified. Um, and then we collect uh, their uh, uh, followers, and uh, the bolded edges here are the edges that are our point of investigation, right? We want to understand uh, how often they disappear, and we want to understand under what circumstances they disappear. So to look at that question, to identify the predictors of unfollowing, uh, we focused on the subset of edges uh, connecting users uh, uh, with a valid account at times T1 and T2, right? So if an account disappears at T2, we don't want to uh, you know, um, uh, erroneously suggest that the edge disappeared. We want to understand that it's the node that disappeared. So we filter those out. Uh, and we also um, limit our attention to uh, the edges for which both the source and destination had valid covariates for our analysis, which is again related to uh, the Twitter activity, uh, uh, the the edge uh, uh, and and uh, and the ideology of the of the person. Um, and so this is for the predictor question for the um, uh, question around prevalence. Again, we can look at these bold edges and see how often they disappear, but we want to have this control group to understand uh, how high or low this number was. Uh, so, and the way that we um, uh, we do this is that we wanted this control group to be as comparable as possible. So we center things on the followers. So for the followers that uh, follow at least one misinformation uh, spreader, we get uh, their entire network uh, and we identify these alters uh, and the, the dashed edges to those are the control group edges that we are uh, uh, going to do the comparison to. Uh, and um, and because this uh, the number of followers we have is really large, uh, uh, you know, extracting uh, their um, uh, ego networks for everyone uh, was out of the scope uh, given the API limits, and you know, obviously impossible at this point. Uh, but um, we sampled basically two point five uh, thousand. Uh, um, active uh, followers from this uh, sample and uh, looked at um, uh, their um, their uh, unfollowing rates. To give you a little bit of uh, an idea, um, uh, uh, by the way, I, I think there are, there are some things on chat, Matt, I'm assuming if there's a question that needs to be asked, you'll you'll raise them so but uh, you know yes yeah yeah I think I'm just gonna let these build up before we bring them up later. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's see what is in our who is in our data. Um, so I'll first start with uh, our examination of the ideology. Here we're using the um, uh, Barbara et al. Um, um, uh, Bayesian model uh, to determine uh, the uh, uh, ideology of the of the users in our in our sample. Uh, and you can see that most followers are conservative, uh, but there's a, a bimodal V shape uh, consistent with the past work um, that we are <clears throat> that we are seeing here. Uh, but you're also seeing that uh, the uh, conservatives are a lot more extreme conservatives compared to compared to uh, liberals. 
Uh, we also wanted to understand questions around like entrenchment. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, how many um, um, followers follow at least you know one, you know two, and and so forth uh, number of spreaders. And you can see that uh, this distribution is right skewed. Uh, most people follow only one misinformation spreader, which is really encouraging. That tells us that if we were to be able to break that tie, we would sort of uh, break their connection to the misinformation world. Uh, but if you compare the uh, distributions for conservatives and liberals, you can see that they are um, different. Conservatives are more entrenched. You can see that there is a sort of more presence in this, in this uh, tale where they follow more misinformation spreaders compared to liberals. So then uh, just a little bit more about this more entrenched group. Um, we focused on the top 10% uh, percent followers in terms of the number of uh, misinformation spreaders they follow. Uh, and here we're looking at their z-scores for uh, the covariates of interest for us. You can see that they are more extreme, uh, which is the absolute ideology score, uh, and they are more conservative. You can see that the is liberal is, is, is uh, uh, negative. Uh, and this is aligned with past work. But we also find some other useful information for our study, which is that they are more active uh, than others. And also that their ties to um, the misinformation spreaders are more reciprocated, right? So they are sort of more sort of connected uh, to this misinformation uh, uh, producers. A interestingly sort of broader investigation of just reciprocation in general, uh, revealed numbers that were really surprising to us. This, these are really high reciprocation numbers. 69% uh, of um, the <clears throat> um, ties to misinformation producers are, are sort of bi-directional. Uh, and it's also, this is also driven by a few spreaders. So a small number of spreaders account for a really large uh, number of reciprocated ties. The Gini coefficient here is higher than sort of um, ties in general. Uh, so this could indicate that either these spreaders are, uh, you know, using um, follow back strategies, uh, and as we will see in the results uh, very soon, unfortunately, this is a you know effective strategy, uh, and uh, or they are part of a kind of close knit uh, community. Um, so we don't know, know the exact reasoning as to why uh, the ties are reciprocated, but these could be two possible explanations. With that. Finally, I'm ready to talk about some of our results, starting with the prevalence uh, question. So um, here, uh, the first question was, how often are they unfollowed? And, and how does that compare to a control group? Here's the result. Uh, we are looking at uh, ties to spreaders versus non-spreaders being uh, um, um, uh, dissolved. Uh, and you can see that the error bar for spreaders is uh, much larger, obviously, because we have fewer of them compared to non-spreaders. Uh, uh, the first finding is that unfollowing is really rare. Only 3.3% of these edges were dissolved in uh, from March to October. Right? Um, and uh, the comparison group tells us that, that users are also more likely to unfollow non-misinformation spreaders compared to spreaders. Right, so that's that's uh, perhaps uh, even uh, more uh, discouraging. Um, to give you a little bit more context, we can do comparisons to past studies. There are not that many studies that look at unfollowing uh, on so uh, social media, but there are a few. Uh, some of them are, you know, outdated. They're like from two thousand eleven and uh, you know thirteen. So uh, things have changed a lot since then. It seems like the the unfollowing rates were were higher back then. But even compared to the rates that we observe in 2018 and 17, uh, the unfollowing rate is, is really uh, small um, in our study. So we did some adjustments to make it monthly because these studies were monthly versus the first number I showed you was throughout the entire study period. So lower unfollowing rates compared to past work. I also have not included it here because it's not directly comparable, but there is a fantastic uh, work by Kaiser et al. that uh, uh, looks at intentions to unfollow. So uh, this is an experimental study where they were asking people whether they would unfollow a friend that shared misinformation and they varied the ideology of the, of the, of the friend. And again, not directly comparable, but it really, our numbers are quite small um, compared to what you would expect from these intentions that show at least some indication to unfollow each, each one of those misinformation spreaders. 
Um, and finally, uh, is this difference that we're seeing uh, significant? Uh, could it, uh, could we see that even if people were not, uh, there was no uh, sort of uh, difference between how they treated spreaders versus non-spreaders? So here, um, we basically test a uh, null hypothesis, uh, which is that um, you know that's um, uh, irre irrelevant whether the the, the friend is is um, a spreader versus uh, not spreader. So this is really it can be thought about as um, as, um, as as sampling uh, without a replacement uh, from all ties and seeing how many of those would expect to be uh, uh, from. Uh, uh, spreaders. So these are what we would expect under this null model, and this is the observed. So what we're seeing is that uh, we are seeing definitely fewer uh, uh, um, um, misinformation spreader ties being broken compared to what we would expect un under this model. So um, this is uh, for the prevalence side, for the now onto the predictor side. Um, and here, uh, we basically identify these predictors uh, uh, using the uh, these covariates related to you know activity ideology uh, the 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 edge uh, using cluster robust logistic regression. We also uh, tried uh, the the Bayesian uh, model regression model that's uh, sort of more costly. They give us similar results. So I'm just showing you the the logistic regression model here. Uh, the x-axis is the marginal effect of uh, this particular factor, and the uh, y-axis is sorted uh, coefficients as a function of, of their uh, marginal effect size. And uh, we can see that the biggest predictor on the negative side is reciprocity. So the reciprocated uh, edges are a lot less likely to be, uh, to be um, dissolved. The second predictor uh, the second biggest predictor is ideology, and it supports our hypothesis three uh, uh, in that um, liberals are more likely uh, to unfollow compared to uh, uh, compared to um, conservatives. Um, when we're looking at uh, um, the exposure at time T1, we actually found support for the reversion hypothesis. So, so those of you that made internal uh, sort of um, predictions as to uh, which way this would go, we found that people who are exposed to more misinformation at time T1 were more likely to, to unfollow. Uh, and um, the ideological extremity uh, um, hypothesis that we had does not hold uh, on average. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's fairly significant, but also it's positive. So we're expecting a negative uh, result, which is that if you're more extreme, you're less likely to unfollow. So let's look at some of these interactions to add some more uh, nuances here. Um, the first one is, uh, again, related to this reversion hypothesis versus inertia hypothesis. Uh, uh, we wanted to see if it holds for uh, uh, the sort of um, liberals and conservatives uh, separately. So here is the plot. We're sh showing here the T1, how T1 exposure uh, um, affects probability of unfollowing. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the marginal effect for the two groups separately. You can see that both of those are positive. So what holds on average also holds separately for liberals and conservatives. So we're seeing evidence for reversion hypothesis for both, uh, but the effect is roughly 1.7 times as strong for liberals. So this is sort of encouraging that we're not seeing a, uh, this entrenchment keeping people in uh, as, as the, 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 at least on average, how, how things hold. But of course, there are going to be individual level uh, differences. The uh, second uh, interaction uh, that uh, I think is worthwhile discussing is the interaction between the ideological strength and ideology. So again, remember uh, that in the main effects, we were finding that hypothesis four, which is that ideological extremity uh, is going to lead to lower uh, unfollowing was refuted. Right? Uh, there was a near zero and positive average uh, uh, marginal effect of ideological extremity on, on unfollowing. Uh, let's see how that uh, varies across the two groups. What we're seeing here is that the, the average effect was masking large partisan asymmetries 
uh, in that uh, here we find uh, that extreme liberals are more likely to unfollow, uh, while extreme conservatives were less likely to unfollow than their uh, moderate uh, counterparts. So when we're looking at this uh, with the uh, with the interaction in mind, we're seeing that indeed the the um, 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 extremity plays out in the way that we expect for uh, for uh, conservatives, and this also provides support for hypothesis five, which is that um, it um, it has this uh, sort of negative uh, interaction. Okay, so um, for this study. This is, as far as we know, please correct us if we're wrong, because this is still an unpublished work. <laughs> uh, the first large scale examination of how misinformation on following happens on social media. But there are various limitations I should uh, note. One, our way of identifying misinformation was uh, high precision, but also uh, likely high low recall, right? So we are only looking at things that are identified by PultiFact as misinformation in this space. Um, the second is that we focused on uh, regular spreaders uh, and patterns might vary for spreaders with extreme popularity. And given the world that we live in where political elite and elite in general uh, play an important role, uh, this is an important investigation for, for, for future work. Um, I've been saying unfollowing, sometimes I've been saying, you know, ties being uh, dissolved. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the tie might be broken because the spreader block the follower as well, though we think that that should be uh, uh, less, less common. And our study period is weird because Musk, uh, we were studying uh, this in, in um, uh, 2023. So unclear if the results would uh, be similar to what you would see in 2020 uh, on, on Twitter, let alone on some other, other platform. Um, and unfortunate reality, uh, this is really heartbreaking, is that um, we might find that, oh, it would be really cool to, you know, pull data in this other way. Uh, and given the changes on in Twitter or X edits to the study in of that sort is unfortunately uh, near impossible. So uh, we had our window uh, to get the things that that we wanted. And um, that window at this point, I think, is uh, is um, closed. Um, some concluding thoughts here. I think the biggest thing that we should take away from this is that following is rare. It's rare. It's rare compared to control group. It's rare compared to past studies, and it's rare compared to unfollowing intentions. Uh, and implications of this discrepancy uh, with the unfollowing intentions is one that hypothetical exercises do not capture realities of actual unfollowing. This is absolutely not a comment on this great work. Uh, this is only to say that they they capture different things, right? Like those that are sort of in the survey world uh, know, for instance, there are differences in what people respond versus how they behave. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here as well. But uh, the other implication of this is that uh, encouraging results perhaps for interventions, that there is room for effective interventions that move individuals towards their stated goals, right? It might be that you know, they don't know that they're sharing misinformation, uh, or it's maybe too cumbersome to identify them and, un and unfollow them. So we can make it easier uh, for the users. And that's one of our goals um, in our ongoing experimental work here. Uh, the reciprocity uh, aspect was the strongest predictor that again, I think has implications for potential interventions. Uh, you know, if you want to have the best chance of an intervention working, and especially given uh, that we're going to try to uh, power our analysis uh, to see some results, it might make the most sense to focus our attention first on unreciprocated ties. But of course, you know, the reciprocated ties are definitely not dissolved, not definitely, but they're not on average dissolving on their own. So they might also require more inter intervention. So this is sort of like two sides of the same coin, if you will. Um, we found stronger evidence for reversion hypothesis as opposed to inertia, but we don't know what's the mechanism, right? We don't know if it's like, for instance, high redundancy or regression to the mean. And that again has implications for the interventions. If it is like high redundancy, maybe you would, your interventions would highlight information overload versus if it is regression to the mean, you just maybe simply have to remind people that they are following this information. 
Um, and, and finally, uh, we saw that extreme conservatives are more likely to consume misinformation that we already knew, less likely to severe ties with those that spread it, and even less likely the more spreaders that they follow, the more entrenched they are. So not surprising, but this is a really big challenge uh, for our field. This is the group that needs the most intervention, but perhaps going to be uh, most resistant to our interventions. And really, finally here, I want to... Uh, uh, you know, acknowledge my collaborators, especially Josh, who is a fantastic doctoral student who has been leading this work. All the amazing things here attributable to him. Uh, you know, advice by uh, me and Eric Gilbert, um, his uh, his uh, co-advisors, and the Mercury Project for for funding this work. So with that, now I'm gonna do. 180 uh, and and switch to the other work that I want to tell you a little bit about. So uh, we'll see uh, how much time uh, we have there. So this was on um, how we can build fun and engaging environments to deliver polarization reducing interventions. Um, given the, um, the audience I'm talking to, I'm not going to spend too much time trying to, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, motivate that. It's partisan hostility in the U.S. is a big problem. It has big important implications for, um, you know, vaccine updates and and um, you know mask wearing or policy positions. All of these things uh, that uh, that uh, are of concern for our society. Um, and the question is, is there a way to fix it? Political communication research identifies various potential interventions. There is a fantastic recent study, a mega study that tested 20 plus interventions in this field and found that uh, one of the most promising was correcting misperceptions. So um, in the space, uh, people perceive out party supporters more extreme than they are. And this is at least some of the reason as to why uh, people do not like the other side. Uh, so I'm gonna take, for instance, the following question. What percentage of Republicans support requiring background checks for gun purchases at private sales or gun shows? I'm going to you know, give you a minute to process this and make up your mind as to what you think the number is. Um, again, you can uh, filter share or, or uh, just share it with yourself. Um, now with that, I will share the actual answer, uh, which is 82%, right? So I don't think I would have expected that I, I, even as someone, uh, that has, uh, has uh, you know, studies in this field, uh, we still hold uh, misperceptions about the other side. Um, and, uh, and again, past work has shown that you can correct these in lab settings and that can re uh, lead to reduction in effective polarization. Our goal being information science people is that how you know how do we present this information in different ways uh, so that it's sort of uh, more uh, appealing uh, uh, so that people will want to do them on their own and again the idea is the environment change the environment take people out of uh, the lab and put them in a game setting so why games are easier to play than talk politics they appeal to a wider audience um, and provides a wide range of interactions between players and also provides a magic circle where you sort of exist in this game world and the outside world is the outside world, which uh, 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 creates the separate social and psychological space. And um, in our design of this uh, game, we, uh, and I should give the most uh, the, the credit to Ashwin, who was uh, the um, lead author and uh, spent so much time thinking through these uh, design principles, uh, as we want to have no prior no political knowledge needed so that it again can be as broadly uh, available or uh, accessible or interesting as possible. Minimal partisan cues, we want the game to be cooperative, that it would be slow so that people actually uh, reflect back on things. And we also had a chat uh, that people can use and people actually engage with that a lot, which made the game more more engaging. Um, so the, um, the game is guessing, uh, guess plus sync with each other. Uh, this is a two-player cooperative game inspired by Wavelength. If you have played this in the past, you will you will get this game pretty quickly. Um, and oops. Um, and oh, okay, 
pairs of players are randomly matched with each other and play five rounds of games. There's also two rounds where they get to learn the game because it's a relatively complex game, but five rounds that are uh, scored. Each round, do, the two players are shown a question. They work together as a team, uh, provide clues and guess the answer, right? So here's at the very high level what this game uh, looks like. So you're matched with Ali here. And again, you can uh, talk uh, on this uh, chat. Um, you can start the trial to learn about the game. Uh, in the initial guess phase, people are given a question. So what percent of adults have seen the movie Titanic? Uh, we will independently share our guesses, register our guesses. And then after that phase, uh, there is a clue giver, uh, a clue giving phase where one of the people are going to be assigned as clue giver. And in our experiments, there, this is going to alternate. Who's going to know the target? So they're going to know the, the real answer is 70. And they're also going to be given the scale from hot to cold and then to give you a clue. So if it's 70%, maybe I'm going to say lemonade, right? It's cold, but not, not too cold. And the person will get that um, clue and then make a guess. And then if the answer is uh, close enough to the actual number, you get some points. So. Um, so that's the game. And at the end of the five rounds, you also get to see what you have done, what were your guesses, what were your final, uh, what, what was the final guess and what was the correct answer uh, and, and so forth. So this is the game that we are going to be using in our experimental procedure. Uh, this is something that we pre-registered uh, between subjects and Turk experiment. Uh, the link is uh, given here. The players were randomly paired and assigned to play either the control version of the game where there is no political question, mixed version where there are some political questions, or fully version where all of the questions are political. And now we also had post-game survey containing the outcome measured mediators and moderators that we were interested in. And we, you know, uh, powered our, we did power analysis to identify how many participants we would need. Uh, and we had 600 plus here in this case. The political questions is the crux of, of this whole thing. Uh, they were selected from national representative ANES, uh, ANES uh, SES, and, and uh, GSS uh, surveys. Uh, and from the set of universal questions we could ask, we went to first MTurk to assess the size of misperception uh, we would see uh, and selected the questions for which the misperception was highest for the out party. Um, and there are a number of questions that we're asking here. I'm not going to get into the details of those. I'm just going to share with you the main hypothesis, which we powered our analysis for, uh, which is that we were expecting that the players would uh, show lower out party hostility and higher willingness to talk to out party supporters uh, for the mixed and fully, uh, fully political game versions. Um, uh, compared to the control version. Uh, we, we weren't sure uh, if mixed or fully would uh, uh, be better because of uh, increased uh, misperception correction, but also perhaps some, uh, some uh, backfire effects. Um, results, did the mixed and fully political games reduce out-party hostility for the main effect? Unfortunately, no, for out-party hostility. It did reduce it uh, for Democrats, but not Republicans. And I'll be happy to talk uh, more in the q and after questions about this as to why. Uh, hint, the, the answer is actually the questions uh, and uh, what kinds of misperceptions we were, we were correcting. Um, and, uh, but we did see increased willingness to talk to politics uh, without party uh, irrespective of this. And related to our main goal of making this fun so that people will wanna do it, is that the answer is, is yes, we found really positive feedback about this uh, from our uh, participants, um, and which is encouraging for us if we can uh, sort of fix some of the issues that we're talking about in terms of the asymmetrical results. This may be something we can, uh, we can uh, try to uh, do at scale. So uh, the idea here is the by changing the environment where polarization reducing interventions are delivered, our goal is to make things more fun and therefore more likely to scale. Uh, the issue of asymmetry across parties is an important one for us to address before we actually try to launch this. Uh, uh, but you can check out the game. If you want to play it, make sure that you have one other person because it's not really actively used right now. Otherwise, you'll be waiting for a while to be matched with someone else. The paper is also here. It was uh, published at CSCW this year. Again, thanks to collaborators. 
the biggest thanks to obviously Ashran, who was a fantastic doctoral student, who is now a fantastic assistant professor at UT Austin, uh, who led this project from start to finish, a great set of undergraduates uh, who uh, helped a lot with um, game design and, and programming and, and, and so forth, and just like ideation in general, and Paul uh, Resnick, my other collaborator, who was also the co-advisor for, for Ashwin. With that, I'm done. So thank you so much for your time. And I'll be very you know, excited to hear your feedback. As I said, the first one is a paper that's not published yet. So uh, for both of them, I'm really interested. But for the first one, I think there's time to make changes uh, before publication. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was uh, very interesting. As I said, we got sort of a bonus, uh, bonus study here. Um, so that's awesome. We can start taking uh, everybody's questions as we uh, typically do, just sort of raise your hand if you want to speak, uh, and I'll sort of pick them off uh, one by one. Um, and then if if nobody has any questions, I can definitely dive in, but I want to give some legal chances. Okay, uh, I think Sohan, you have your hand raised, go ahead. We're just trying to... Uh... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um... So I'm I'm trying. Um, I'm wondering if like some of the reciprocity effect could be because of uh, things like follower networks and things like that, like the effects of. Um, I mean, I'm hoping I didn't misunderstand like what this actually means, but like it's it seems like. Um, um, there are like follower networks online where people, you know, follow other people who follow people and follow backs and those kinds of things. So I wonder if that could be like impacting the behavior. Right. So, um, so it could be that it could be in in different ways. It could be that maybe some of those are or are sort of uh, bot accounts and 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 they are maybe have a a, a um the the spreader is buying and also trying to follow back to create sort of tighter uh, communities. Even if they're not buying, it might be that when somebody follows you, you to keep them in, you would again uh, follow them back. Uh, and 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 that again, to me, it sounds like if that's what they're doing, that is a, a good strategy. Because again, we're seeing that those kinds of ties are not uh, dissolved uh, and that's like the biggest biggest factor. So we don't know, we don't know at what, uh, or it could be that again, they are like the, these followers that we're looking at are uh, themselves, I mean, we, they are not spreaders in the way that we have defined them, but they might be sort of really closely connected to these uh, misinformation uh, communities and 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 this uh, spreaders might be also uh, in this in these tight communities, which might be also explaining the the results. Does that? Right, thank you. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Oh no, Great. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'll jump in really quick, and then and Jelly, uh, I'll, I'll go to you next. Um, so Duran, I think if I'm not mistaken, you said that you, for your spreaders, you're looking at like sort of these regular users that don't have many followers um, or, or they don't have, they have up to 20,000 followers. Uh, so some of the work that we've done in looking at sort of like super spreaders, um, you know, obviously suggests that they're sort of responsible for spreading a little bit more of the misinformation. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm curious if you're, if you thought about this sort of, yeah. You know, I know there's all these technical difficulties with getting you know, followers for millions of people and this kind of thing. So I understand why you made this limitation, but in sort of framing it in this sort of perspective, um, yeah. how do you think about the, the problem? And then if I could just pin a, a, sort of an appendix to that is um, you frame things a lot in terms of thinking about potential interventions. Uh -huh. um, and some of the work that we've done looking at uh, super spreaders is show that they're, these are like the most prominent and sort of public facing figures uh, and that, for example, Twitter seems to show at least some reluctance to sort of policing these these kinds of users. So, is it what kind of interventions do you think might might be reasonable to expect if uh, if we were to try to target these kinds of more prominent accounts, or is that sort of not really what you guys are considering? Yeah, no, I think that those are great questions, and um, and I completely wholeheartedly agree that uh, these uh, popular accounts, elite and and political elite, as I said, are like really playing a big role here so they they should be uh, they should absolutely be studied our intuition 
was sort of twofold. One of them is the technical difficulties of of, of uh, uh, st studying them, but it was also we were when we were thinking about our experiment, we were uh, trying to. So there are different strategies you can have. You can be like, I'm gonna test everything, or you can say, I'm gonna go for mm. test like the, uh, the the case that's going to give me the uh, uh, some significant result. If I don't, if I can't get it there, I'm not gonna get it anywhere else. Mm. So I'll our see. intuition was like, let's uh, see, uh, you know. Will I be able to convince you to follow to unfollow a really popular person? Our mm. intuition was that maybe not that. So let's first study this group. Um, when we first started this, we're like, well, we'll first do this, and then we'll go to and we'll try to understand. <laughs> uh, if yeah. We have uh, you know resources. We'll try to understand these uh, bigger groups. And even when we first started, it was challenging, and it just kind of we got sort of more and more, uh, you know. Uh, we like shrunk and shrunk uh, and, and that's uh, <laughs> what we could have uh, gotten but I, I absolutely agree with you that we should understand how these people are being unfollowed and so that uh, we can we can uh, design interventions for them cool thank you uh jelly you got your hand up you can go ahead whenever you're ready hi uh can you hear me yes Okay, so yeah, I just want to um, yeah read my question in the chat. Yeah, uh, for the first uh, study, uh, there are a lot of reasons and why why people unfollow an account. I wonder how you control variables and exclude other reasons. Right. I mean, there are uh, many compounds that that we we uh, have not and could not. Uh, <laughs> Of, uh, control for uh, uh, given the data that we had uh, access to. So we are looking at uh, their Twitter activity levels are like basically things that we could get relatively e easily that again goes back to uh, the, some of the uh, API limitation questions, but some things that we have uh, good reasons to believe that there would be connections. Uh, so some of these were in our hypotheses uh, around activity levels, ideology, for instance. Um, and and uh, and uh, reciprocity. So there are other things like what what is it that they are saying, for instance, could be an important uh, aspect. Uh, and it might be uh, that you know if they're just generally sharing things that are not necessarily misinformation, but something else that they're doing, it might be toxicity of their language and and whatnot. So there are absolutely other reasons. So which is uh, why I can't say we have found everything. But uh, we were looking for, again, things that we will be able to identify and also will be able to inform our interventions where uh, we, we can also do them at, at, at scale. So we were looking at you know, a subset of possible things. Um, and yeah, I do think that there's uh, future work in trying to understand some of these other things, which is maybe the language and, and so forth would also be uh, quite, uh, quite helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, Phil, go go ahead. There, hi. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Great talk, and as always, I want to thank Matt and Caitlin for organizing. I have a couple of very uh, small technical questions. One is, um, you said that your unfollowing your detection of unfollowing also detects accounts that block another account. How does that work? I, I I don't know about blocking. I know that recently, yeah. uh, after mask, there is a there is a push towards uh, encouraging muting, but not blocking. So any anything that you can say about that? And the second one um, is uh, when you identify the people who shared uh, misinformation in order to find their followers. It, it was this only people who posted uh, original tweets with links to those uh, misinformation URL, um, articles or also people who had retweeted them? Um, yeah, so these are just small technical details. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, so the first question uh, uh, was, oh God, I already forgot. This one was around- A Blocking. Blocking, yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, I guess all I was saying is that we actually can't identify whether it's blocking. So we know that the edge disappeared. So we have T1, we know the, ex uh, the edge exists. In T2, we know the edge doesn't exist. 
So we just don't know if it was initiated by the source or the des uh, or the uh, destination of the edge, if you will. So uh, that's why I'm like, because I'm saying I'm following a lot and I think that's what we think is mostly what's happening. We just sort of more of a, of a caveat. I wish we could, that would be uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the second question around uh, how we are identifying. Yes, yeah, so we have, uh, we started with the URLs and tweets. And then we found people who posted them. But we also included the people who retweeted them. Uh, and um, and I, I should also say that we were, uh, so I didn't get into the, the details of this uh, that much. We didn't want to uh, oversample from one spreader. So we actually, when we looked at our, our sample, we found that there were a few cases where like there's just like one tweet uh, that was a retweet uh, that was sort of a little murky that was really accounting for a large number of things. So we didn't want like one tweet to be a dominating thing. So we actually had a strategy for in a sort of greedy fashion, increasing our our uh, our uh, spreader pool, trying to make it as diverse as possible uh, across uh, across um, sort of unique misinformation cases. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. And then with a couple of minutes left, I wanted to ask uh, some sort of high, high level questions for the, your second study about the game um, and more just sort of like, I guess, kind of your thoughts for, I guess, like the future of the game. Um, so it, it sounds like you just, you designed it mostly for this study, but do you have any sort of larger plans for applying it to, you know, different types of, uh, different types of game settings or uh, any other kind of applications? And then sort of in, in addition, I'm curious about your, you know, everybody's uh, sort of in a craze about generative generative AI, and I can imagine a similar kind of game. You could sort of try to make a, an agent that does that plays the other side of this game, yeah. uh, depending on the person's ideology. I'm curious if you thought about that at all. Um, we're thinking about kind of like browser extensions for fact checking uh, related to this. I guess mentioned to you before we started. So, any any thoughts on this would be would be really interesting. Sure. Both awesome questions. So the first one is that I would say. Uh, as I said, Ashwin was the uh, the um, lead author uh, on this project, and he's a freshly minted, you know, assistant professor. So uh, I, I am really so I think that that I'm hoping that he's going to be sort of a leader in in this space, and then we might collaborate. But like again, I just want to give all the credit to him, and I think <laughs> extra credit as well. So uh, the one thing that we you know, we worked on this quite a lot and we're like trying to find a fun game and we're like making cooperative, but there were simpler versions of the game. So this is one of the ones that mm. I think that Ashwin is working on right now, which is it's not cooperative. You're just learning on your own and you're making mm. it fun, but again, correcting misperception. So there is, that might be a little bit easier to, uh, to you know, recruit people for and and and, and so forth. It's like a simpler uh, 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 design, but the goal is really having these, I think, toolbox of, of games that are out there that uh, might uh, play pro social uh, roles in our society so absolutely the second one um yes so the the <laughs> the question the, the question might be in the game in this particular game setting but just in general uh my sort of leaning with things around uh chat gpt is uh you know i feel like there's some hype in the space, but there are ways that are that we can it can be useful. So there are some things that are really costly. So for instance, we we say, oh, if we put you know uh, out party members in conversation together and correct misperceptions, that can you know make things better. But sometimes this is really costly for a minority group to try to convince hmm. a, a a sort of a majority a group uh, of their you know. Uh, humanity, for instance. So uh, in, in ways that we can sort of put that cost on on a, an, an automated agent uh, and and have the same effect, I'm really interested in things like that. And we're working on uh, some of these related questions with uh, with starting to work on it with, with Josh and Eric, actually. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, stay tuned, but I'm also staying tuned for, for some of the work that you guys are producing as well. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we're we're out of time, uh, perfectly on time. So I appreciate everybody timing their questions well. Uh, and so let's thank uh, Duran one more time. And I will uh, plug next week, we have uh, Renee Duresta with us as well. Um, so please uh, come back and, and join us then. And with that, I'll say goodbye and see everybody there. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.